But from our perspective, we are confident we will get this done. We will get this aid to Ukraine. And in the meantime, we're not just waiting. As Andre mentioned, just last week we announced uh, from the White House podium a package of $300 million of ammunition, air defense, and other critical supplies that are needed right now on the front lines, and we are rushing those supplies to you as we speak. So we are going to do everything in our power to continue to support you in your efforts as you go forward. And we will work with the rest of the world as well, a coalition of more than 50 nations standing strong in support of Ukraine. This is my video update on this Thursday morning, March the 21st. Let's talk about some news. And let's start things off with a huge Russian missile strike, or Russian missile strikes actually, in uh, the Kharkov region and in Kiev, which uh, happened yesterday evening. Now, we don't have an official statement as of the time of this video recording from the Russian Ministry of Defense. But um, the, the initial reports are that the Russian military took out uh, decision-making centers and infrastructure facilities in uh, Kharkov and specifically in Kiev. And the Russian military used strategic cruise missiles and Kinzhal hypersonic missiles. Though this has not, uh, has not been confirmed by the Russian Ministry of Defense. This is not, uh, we don't have an official statement from the Russian Ministry of Defense. I'm just going off of initial reports from various military uh, analysts and uh, military social media accounts. We do have an official statement from the Ukraine Air Force. And this morning, the Ukraine Air Force, they said that Ukraine downed 31 missiles overnight and that Ukraine shot down all the missiles launched by Russia. This is an official statement from the Ukraine Air Force. So let's wait until this afternoon or perhaps tomorrow for an official statement from the Russian MOD as to what uh, what they targeted in these missile strikes and uh, what type of missiles were used. So let's uh, move on to, to what I think was the big news, the shocking news from, uh, from yesterday, which was the resignation of the Irish Prime Minister, Mr. Leo Varadkar. And uh, this, this news came out of, out of nowhere. I was not expecting Varadkar to resign. I was not expecting Varadkar to be the latest victim of the Alensky curse. Now, Varadkar, he did travel to Kiev, I believe, a year ago in a surprise visit to meet with Alensky. And, uh, and yeah, the, the Alensky curse... It got him. Alensky number five draws them in. The allure and the, and the scent of Alensky number five draws the collective West leaders in. And then the Alensky curse strikes them down. <laughs> that is how this works. But uh, Varadkar, he said in a statement, politicians are human beings and we have our limitations. We give it everything until we can't anymore. And I believe the, the main reason for his resignation what Varadkar said is the main reason is, is basically for uh, personal reasons. He's given everything he, he has to give to, to, the, uh, to the position, the job of uh, Prime Minister of Ireland, and he just doesn't have any more tank, le any more gas left in the tank. And uh, that was pretty much the reason that he gave for his resignation. But um, I don't buy that, and I don't think anyone buys it. Buys it personal reasons. No, nah, that's not why he resigned. He resigned for one of two reasons, and all the analysis about his resignation focuses on either having to, to, uh, having to do with the referendum that failed a couple of weeks ago, changing the, the constitution of, uh, of Ireland and 
changing the the status of of uh, or the definition of of a woman and and her place in in Irish society and her place in the family and, and they had a referendum about this and it was defeated in a big big way and so there is uh, a lot of analysis which claims that this is why he resigned because of the the referendum results and there's also analysis which claims that the real reason that Barat Carr resigned is because of his uh, St. Patrick's Day speech at uh, at the uh, White House, Biden standing next to him, where Barat Carr pretty much said that, uh, no, he actually said that uh, Ireland supports the Palestinians or why the people of Ireland support the Palestinians and the Palestinian cause. And uh, this upset a lot of people in uh, the Biden administration. And the, the analysis is that after he gave this speech in uh, support of the Palestinians or explaining why the Irish support the Palestinians, he got the call and they told him, Leo, it's time to, uh, to step down. And that was it. I, I think that was the reason. If I had to take a guess, and I'm no expert in... Uh, in the politics of, of Ireland. But if I had to take a guess, I would say it was not the referendum results, though that could have played a, a role in his uh, resignation, but it was more to do with that St. Patrick's Day speech at the White House and pretty much uh, supporting the Palestinians and going against the Biden White House's policy towards, uh, towards Israel. So I think that's what did Virat Kar in. So, uh, yeah, that was, that was big news. That was uh, shocking news because I don't think anyone really expected Barad Carr to, to be the latest victim of the Alensky curse. But there you have it. So, uh, Alensky, sticking with Alensky, Politico, they put out an article with the title, What Ukraine Thinks of Republicans' Loan Plan. So this plan was was offered to Alensky via Lindsey Graham's trip to Kiev the other day, where Lindsey Graham told Alensky that uh, we can get you money, but it's going to have to be in the form of a loan, or, or at least the, the Uniparty and the American public will most likely support $61 billion to your administration, Alensky, if we give it to you in the form of a loan. And Graham said... Uh, you can pay us back. You can pay this loan back. But if you can't pay this loan back, no problem. But we have to structure it in the form of a loan. And uh, that's what Graham told Alensky. And Politico is now giving us Alensky's response to this loan plan, this loan proposal that Graham brought to him. And according to Politico, Ukraine was practically not even informed about this idea, but it does not like it. That is what a source close to the Ukrainian president's office told Politico. They don't like it. <laughs> they don't like the load idea. A Politico says in their article that, uh, that Volodymyr Omelyan who used to serve as the country's infrastructure minister, said, and I quote, if we win, you will be paid back in Russian oil, gas, diamonds, and fur. If we lose, there will be no issue about money. It will become the issue of how the West can survive. So that was a statement from, from a former infrastructure minister, a statement that he gave to Politico. Give us the money, and if we win, we'll pay you back in... In the plundering of Russia is what he, he means, because Russia will collapse and the collective West can then enter Russia and vulcanize it and plunder it. And the West will be paid back at $61 billion in the form of Russian oil, gas, diamonds, and fur. Interesting statement from Omelian. If Ukraine loses, well, tough luck. <laughs> tough luck. You're not going to get paid back any money. So uh, Sullivan made a surprise trip to Kiev yesterday. And uh, Sullivan, he told the Alensky regime that money is on its way. 
money is coming. And this was a surprise trip. No one, well, no one was expecting Sullivan to, uh, to make his way to Kiev, but there he was. He met with Zelensky and uh, behind closed doors, and then he gave a, a public uh, press conference with Yermak sitting next to him, Zelensky's uh, entertainment lawyer. And uh, Sullivan said that we are confident we will get a strong bipartisan vote in the House for an assistance package for Ukraine, and we will get that money out the door. It's already taken too long. I'm not going to make predictions about exactly when this will get done. So Sullivan is confident that the House will approve some money to project Ukraine. He didn't specifically say $61 billion. He didn't give a, a time frame as to when this money will be approved. But he seems to be very confident that some money, something will be approved by the, uh, the House. I believe there's going to be an Easter break coming up for, uh, for Congress. I want to say um, middle of, of April. And I don't think that they're going to get anything approved from now until Easter break. So you're going to probably look at some sort of, uh, of a push to get some money to Ukraine after the, uh, the Easter break, the Easter holidays. But um, Schmeagel, my precious Schmeagel, the Ukraine prime minister, also said that uh, money is coming. He says that money's coming in March, according to Bloomberg. But I, I don't think I don't think so. And maybe, maybe they will approve some money, something coming into March. But uh, the big, the big payday for uh, Project Ukraine, I imagine, is going to come middle end of of April, maybe early May. I don't know. But uh, that was Sullivan in uh, in Kiev. Sullivan also said that. Uh, that Ukraine can win and the United States will support Ukraine and uh, the United States believe that, believes that Ukraine can, can win this conflict. But there were some reports, and I can't, I can't confirm this, I can't confirm this, but there were some, uh, some reports from Ukraine media saying that behind closed doors, Sullivan, when he was meeting with the Alensky uh, regime, he he did not mention taking back uh, territory. And this was one of the first times that Sullivan did not talk about uh, territorial gain or, or going after Crimea and taking Crimea, capturing Crimea and stuff like that. And that Sullivan was telling them that a victory for, uh, for Ukraine means Ukraine managing to exist. For the state of Ukraine to exist, and for the state of Ukraine to, to enter the EU and, uh, and NATO and to be a, a democracy and, and, and have Western values and all of this stuff, that would be a victory for Ukraine. I can't confirm this, but there, there are Ukraine media channels reporting that this is what Sullivan told the Alensky regime. And this is the, the first time that Sullivan was not talking about uh, capturing territory and then pushing the Russians uh, back. So if this is true, then then this is important. But once again, I cannot confirm this. So um, Sikorsky, thank you, USA. Sikorsky, the foreign minister of Poland, he said in an interview with DPA that uh, there are indeed NATO troops in Ukraine. DPA is, I believe, is a German uh, media channel. They uh, they interviewed Sikorsky, and Sikorsky said, as your Chancellor Olaf Scholz said, there are already some troops from big countries in Ukraine. Asked by DPA whether Scholz's revelation was a problem, Sikorsky responded in Polish, we have the expression Tajenica Polishneya, which describes a secret that everyone knows. Sikorsky reiterated that Warsaw would not send ground troops to Ukraine, citing historical reasons. Ukraine and Poland have been one country for 400 years. This would provide fodder for Russian propaganda. Therefore, 
We should be the last ones to do so, he concluded. Interesting statement, huh? Ukraine and Poland have been one country for 400 years. Poland and West Ukraine have been one country for 400 years, to be more accurate. That's what Sikorsky should have said. But uh, if he believes that Ukraine will eventually just be the west of Ukraine, a rump western part of, uh, of Ukraine, and Ukraine and Poland have been one country for 400 years, then maybe Sikorsky is alluding to, to something, something that could happen in, uh, in the future. Sikorsky, keep in mind, is uh, a, a very high-ranking uh, globalist and uh, neocon. But um, it's a secret that everyone knows, he said, that NATO troops are in Ukraine. True, true. I don't disagree with that statement. Even Putin the other day said that uh, everyone knows that NATO troops are uh, operating in Ukraine as mercenaries. I, I always think that, uh, I always believe that when the Russians say NATO troops are in Ukraine, they mean mercenaries, though they also understand that these aren't really mercenaries. But, um, you know, it's a secret. It's a secret that, that everyone knows. Yeah, that is true. There are big uh, strikes in, in Poland today, I believe. Big farmer protests in Poland, like massive farmer protests. And they're closing all kinds of, of roads and highways and motorways. And um, let me know, uh, anyone that is watching this video from Poland, if, if there are big uh, farmer protests and if they are uh, having uh, an effect on, um, on what's happening in Poland with regards to... Uh, to the import of Ukraine food and the tariffs and, and all of this stuff. But um, Pirate Schultz, let's talk about Pirate Schultz now. He gave a speech to lawmakers in Berlin yesterday. And uh, Pirate Schultz, not Olaf Schultz, this was, this was without a doubt Pirate Schultz. He said that Germany will not let Putin alter Ukraine's borders or impose terms. Quote, we will not accept a dictated peace at the expense of Ukraine, Pirate Schultz told German lawmakers. Law is stronger than violence. We will not let him get away with this. Germany's backing of Ukraine will not decrease. Expecting otherwise would be a miscalculation. Schultz also criticized Putin's re-election, saying it showed Russia is not strong. Pirate Schultz talking all kinds of, uh, of law international law and law is stronger than violence law is stronger than violence we will not let him get away with this <laughs> yeah we will not let him get away with this you mean like how you let the uh i was going to say how you you mean how you let uh gilligan and um and the skipper and zaluzhny blow up the Nord Stream pipeline <laughs> I was going to say how you let the United States, but we don't know that the United States blew up Nord Stream, do we? But uh, Olaf, man, Olaf, you're not going to let Putin get away with Ukraine, but you're going to let Gilligan, the skipper and Marianne, and uh, former General Zeluzhny get away with blowing up uh, German, Germany's critical gas pipeline? What about all that international law stuff? <laughs> What about that law is stronger than violence stuff, Olaf Schultz? <laughs> oh, boy. Pirate Schultz. Man, I like Pirate Schultz. I really, really, really like Pirate Schultz. <laughs> We're not going to let Putin get away with this stuff, matey. And then we're going to make him walk the plank hard. <laughs> ah, Pirate Schultz. Talking tough, my man. You are talking tough. Let's see if you can uh, walk the walk and talk the talk. So uh, let's see here. Uh, TASS, they, uh, they asked the, the government of Sunak, the prime minister's office in the UK, if, uh, if the UK is going to send troops into Ukraine after uh, Macron sends troops 
into Ukraine. And uh, the prime minister's office of Rishi Sunak, they told the Russian media TASS that British soldiers are not going to fight side by side with Ukrainians. They added that the government in London has ruled out a full-blown military deployment, a full-blown military deployment. And they're not going to fight side by side with uh, Ukrainians. I don't know. I think, uh, I think that statement leaves open a lot of different possibilities for, for the role that uh, British troops could play in, in Ukraine if, if there is indeed some sort of, of a French or collective West incursion. But anyway, that is what the Prime Minister's Office of uh, Rishi Sunak told TASS news agency. Keep in mind that Obama met with Sunak just the other day. So I wonder if Obama told Sunak, you can escalate up to a certain point with uh, Ukraine. But remember, it was Obama who, uh, who said that, uh, that the U.S. in no way is going to, to take on Russia with regards to Crimea because he said that Russia has escalatory dominance in the region, even though it was the Obama administration and Vice President Biden and Newland who overthrew the democratically elected government of Ukraine in 2014. It was Obama who, uh, who put the brakes on, uh, on Project Ukraine back then. This is enough. We overthrew the government. That's it. I'm putting a stop to, to everything. And he said, we're not going to, to take on Russia in a war with, uh, with regards to Crimea. So maybe Obama told Sunak, uh, we can go up to here and up to here, but we can't cross this line or that line because if we do, we're going to get smashed. Anyway, that is uh, what the British government uh, said. Uh, Jungle Joseph, he came out with a statement yesterday and he said that uh, if the United States does not give money to Project Ukraine, then uh, the EU will not be able to support Project Ukraine. So Joseph, he came out and he said that Without the United States, Project Ukraine is pretty much done. It is finito. Even though the European Union yesterday, they managed to approve the, the 5 billion euros to go into the EU peace fund, which is really a fund to purchase weapons. So they got the money approved and it's going to go into the EU peace fund and they're going to use that money to provide weapons to Project Ukraine, though the office of Ursula van der Pirate, uh, they came out with a statement and said that 90% of the, of the 5 billion will be used to purchase weapons and then 10% will be used for, for other administrative uh, reasons. 10% for the big guy, I guess, is what the office of uh, van der Pirate uh, said the, the other day with regards to this 5 billion. And of course you have the 5.5 billion or something like that which are the uh, which is the interest from the Russian frozen assets, which they're still trying to figure out a way to to steal that money. And uh, the Kremlin, they came out with a statement yesterday after the EU uh, approved the five billion and uh, and moved one step closer to to stealing the the interest on the Russian frozen assets. The Kremlin came out with a statement and said, if you steal that money, if you steal the interest on our frozen assets then uh, you are breaking international law. We're going to go after you. And uh, the EU financial system is going to be damaged in a big, big way. So the Kremlin, they put out a pretty, a pretty strict, uh, strict warning to, uh, to the European Union. Don't even take the interest on our uh, frozen assets. So that is, that is what the Kremlin has said yesterday let's do a couple of more stories and uh, then we'll get into today's very good clown world and uh let's see here assange how about this one this is an interesting one according to the wall street journal the u.s justice department is speaking with assange's lawyers and there may be some sort of a deal where assange uh, pleads guilty to a misdemeanor to misdemeanor charges and the u.s justice department uh they do not extradite assange to the u.s 
the potential deal would see Assange plead guilty to mishandling classified information with the five years he has already served in London's Belmarsh prison, counting as his sentence, the unnamed sources told the Wall Street Journal. Assange's lawyers, according to, according to the Wall Street Journal, Assange's lawyers, they, uh, they confirmed that they are having this, uh, these talks with the Justice Department, but they also said that they're not confident that the Justice Department will agree to this type of an arrangement, which would effectively see Assange uh, be free. Five years served, pleads guilty to these misdemeanor charges, and that's it. This may be some sort of an election uh, ploy by the Biden White House, because this would be a very popular, uh, very popular action by the Biden White House, by his uh, Department of Justice to, to free Assange, especially with... Uh, with the younger, the younger voters who are very upset with Biden over his uh, position on Israel and uh, and the war in Gaza, so this may be some sort of an election uh, tactic to to win over some of the the young vote, which which is very pissed off with Joe Bidenopolis, and it also, in a way, it also maybe it pleases the the hardcore neocons, maybe. Because it says, look, he does plead guilty to misdemeanor charges, so we get him to plead guilty. Five years served in, in Belmarsh. So maybe he can, he can kind of convince the neocons that, uh, that this is a good deal because he effectively does plead guilty to, this, to these charges. We'll see. Let's see what, uh, what happens uh, with these talks. But that, that is what is being reported by the Wall Street Journal. And we also have reports that Trump is uh, not only considering Tim Scott to be his vice president, which would be a really, really bad move, but now there are reports that Trump is absolutely considering Marco Rubio to be his vice president. Marco Rubio. Oh boy, that would be that would be even worse than Tim Scott. <laughs> I mean, my God, Marco Rubio's neocon light. He's a neocon. He's he's maybe on the lighter side of things, but he's a neocon, no doubt about it. But uh, Trump is considering him to be his vice president. That would be a very dumb move. But uh, you know, Trump, Trump, he's got this. This vulnerability, this fascination, vulnerability, I don't know what it is with, with neocons. For some reason, the neocons, they have this, this control or power over, over Trump. And uh, he hasn't been able to shake it. Even after everything the neocons did to him during his first term, everything after his first term, no matter what the neocons do to Trump, he still, he still goes back to, he still goes back to them. I don't know. I can't explain it, but uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe these reports are false. Maybe they're trying to get uh, Trump's uh, base to, to turn against him. I don't know, but uh, because obviously Trump's base is not going to be happy with Tim Scott as a vice president or uh, Marco Rubio. But I don't know. The reports are that, that he is seriously considering Rubio to be his running mate. Anyway, let's do a clown world and we can wrap this video up. And uh, in this clown world, we are going to talk about Macron the Boxer. <laughs> Macron the Boxer. So I don't know if you guys have seen these images of Macron working out. From what I understand, this is the official photographer of the president of France who published these photos of Emmanuel Macron boxing. That's right. Working the bag, <laughs> Macron is working the the heavy bag there, and, and he's uh he's probably imagining that uh, that as he's punching the bag, it's 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 the Putin, right? <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna show you, Putin. <laughs> I am Jupiter. I am Napoleon. <laughs> oh, Macron, the tough guy. Pirate Schultz, the tough guy. Macron, the tough guy. <laughs> 
Oh boy, I'm sure Putin is is just shaken at uh, at these images of Macron working the bag. <laughs> and by the way, Marine Le Pen, she came out with a statement yesterday, and she said that all of this talk about French military into Ukraine is nonsense. She said that this is uh, all about uh, internal political um, stuff from Macron. So that is what Marine Le Pen said in a statement yesterday as well. But um, look, Macron, he's, he's working out and he's building those strong muscles to take on the Putin. That is the video, everybody, the Duran.locals.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, Telegram, Rockfin, and Twitter X. And go to the Duran shop, 20% off all Greek flag merchandise. Use the code GREASE20 and uh, pick up some other merch as well. I've got a Duran uh, jacket today and a long sleeve shirt with the flag of Portugal. Take care.